Pastor is not here today. He's in Chennai. You remember last week he talked about his school, where it's the 175th anniversary today, and he's preaching at the service. So to keep him at prayer. Uh, sweet, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for being here with us this morning. Lord, thank you for your presence, uh, Lord, that draws us to yourself. Thank you, Lord, for every reminder of who you are. And Lord, as we've sung, we do want to be those who would be singing when the evening comes. But Lord, we know that sometimes that's difficult and it doesn't happen. But Lord, I pray this morning that your spirit would meet us and help us, Lord, that we would indeed find 10,000 reasons to give you thanks. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Habakkuk, please. Uh, and for those of you who need a little help, uh, it's just after Nahum, which I'm sure you'll find also very easily. Nahum comes after Micah, and Micah comes after Jonah. Right? So you've got four before, and if you go to Matthew, then just come back four books. Yeah, so. <laughs> Habakkuk, it's a small prophet, three chapters. Uh, and we'll, uh, we'll won't read it thing, but we'll go through it and pick up verses as we go through it for sake of time. The context of the book of Habakkuk, it's written in about 600 BC. And, uh, but as we look at it and as we read it, it could very well have been written today. And horrible things are happening to the prophet Habakkuk as he looks at it. If you know some of the history, uh, the good king Josiah had died, uh, in, been killed in battle, and the bad king Joachim was now on the throne. And perhaps Habakkuk looks and he says, well, how come the good king dies and the bad king is, is ruling? Uh, and perhaps we can relate to that too, because life doesn't seem fair, and those who shouldn't be there seem to be in authority, and those who should be there are not. And like Habakkuk, we too might be crying out for relief. We're trying to understand because all that we've been asking and all that we've been praying for, we don't seem to get any response. And like we sang, it's hard to really sing, um, you know, and to really honestly give God, thanks to God. And we cry out and say in those situations, God, where are you? Like Habakkuk cries out, how could you allow this to happen? And I would submit to you this morning that perhaps that's, that's exactly where God would have us be that asking that question is really what God calls each one of us to. Because when we come with that question and we can grapple with it, right? We don't park it, but we grapple with it. God, where are you in the challenges of life, in this world that's around us that doesn't make sense? Then we understand and we have something to, to share with others around us who are also grappling with that same question. Because the world needs those who feel the pain personally. The world needs those who have gone and understand what the challenges are. Not just an academic response, but who can relate to it firsthand, to what sin has done in our lives and into the lives around people around us and in the world around us. And those people who relate to that, who understand it, are prophets. And I want believe God has for us this morning three things I want to leave with you. Those who've done marketing, remember the four Ps? Well, I'm going to just leave three Ps with you this morning. First, what does it mean to be like Habakkuk, to grapple with it and to see ourselves as a prophet? But then the promise that God gives. And thirdly, the perspective that he shared with Habakkuk. And I believe that he would have for us this morning. Prophet, promise, and perspective. And the, who is a prophet? Sometimes we have this image of, you know, somebody like John the Baptist, uh, you know, looks a little weird, walking around, uh, dressed funnily, but that's not who it is. The person is the one who, prophet is a person who burns with passion, who gets a sense of the horror, that things are not right as they should be. And that's the kind of person the Lord is looking for. And I believe for those of us who have been in a place like this, so when God takes us through, he doesn't take it us through it for no reason. He takes it so that we can understand and we can deal with it and then we can speak and share his truth to others as well. There's no coolness in the life of a prophet. The prophets burned as they spoke. Let's just read how Habakkuk starts his uh, small uh, 
prophecy, chapter 1, reading verses 1 to 4. This is the message Habakkuk the prophet received. Lord, how long must I ask for help and you ignore me? I cry out to you about violence, but you don't save us. Why do you make me see wrong things and make me look at trouble? People are destroying things and hurting others in front of me. They're arguing and fighting. So the teachings are weak and justice never comes. Evil people gain gain while good people lose. The judges no longer make fair decisions. Sound like the world we live in? Sounds like what the newspaper says every day. And as Habakkuk looks at that, he's angry. He sees the sin, the debauchery that's around him. And he sees Babylon right on the horizon coming in towards uh, this land which God had promised to his people, threatening to overwhelm and take, uh, destroy everything. And he asks God in that situation, God, where are you? And perhaps you and I can relate to that this morning. Perhaps we too, or you and I in that place where we're actually a little angry with God this morning. God, this is not supposed to happen. This is not what your promises told me. This is not how it should be shaping up. But we have to engage with that. Let's not step away from that place. That's a place that we can be in and God can relate to us and speak to us in that place. Rabbi Zacharias says to walk away from one's faith because of unanswered questions about evil is to walk into a storm of unanswered questions about good. The question is this morning, do we burn as we see the wrong around us? More than just righteous indignation that it shouldn't be there, but that God, why? Do we grapple with it? Do we ask God to give us the reason, a sense behind it? Because biblical people should burn, prophets burn. And the first thing that I would leave with you this morning is that if God's called us in that place as prophets, we should be burning. But prophets also diagnose. They don't just burn. They look into the situation and they try to understand what is God really doing? What's below the surface? We live in a culture that's very superficial. We celebrate beauty. We celebrate wealth. You're the Fortune 500. We never have the Fortune bottom 500, right? Everything, we look at the biggest, the largest, the brightest. Uh, but prophets look below the surface. What's at the foundation? What's below? And there's no instant cure. But with the long view, if we're with as prophets, we need to know and see as Habakkuk did. We look at our history and we look at God's purposes for the future. And then we can explain where all this is headed. We know that God's placed us in this time of history, in this place. As we look back and we look forward, we know that there is a plan and a purpose. Look at chapter 2 as it starts. He says, I will stand like a guard to watch and place myself at the tower. I will wait to see what he will say to me. I will wait to learn how God will answer my complaint. As a prophet, he asked God to explain it to him so that he in turn can explain it to other people. And the Lord answers him and says, verses 2 and 3, he says, The Lord answered me and says, Write down the vision. Write it clearly on clay tablets so whoever reads it can run to tell others. It's not yet time for the message to come true. But that time is coming soon. The message will come true. It may seem like a long time, but be patient and wait for it because it will surely come. It will not be delayed. God is working through history, but his sense of history is a long term. He will not be hustled. He will not be rushed. And we as God's people, uh, like Habakkuk, have to learn to wait. He will come. But even when the sky looks like it's falling, we can trust God for what the appointed time will be in the tomorrow of history. And so Habakkuk looks from the tar and he looks at the present generation and with the Spirit's help, he's able to discern what are the challenges, why are the people in the place that they're in. And he lists a couple of things down. In verse 4 he, of chapter 2, he talks about the pride and arrogance of the people. They think they're running the world and that sounds very much like what we have each day around us. Verse 6, he talks about woe or terrible. Uh, depending on the translation you've got. And he says how terrible it will be for the one who steals many things and gets rich by forcing others to pay for them. Sounds familiar? Verse 9, he says, How terrible it will be for the nation that becomes rich by doing wrong, thinking they'll live in a safe place and escape harm. 
Verse 12, how terrible it will be for the nation that kills people to build a city that wrongs others to start a town. Verse 15, how terrible for the nation that makes its neighbors drink, pouring from the jug of wine until they're drunk so it can look at their naked bodies. And verse 18, he says, an idol does no good because a human made it. It's only a statue that teaches lies. The one who made it expects his own work to help him, but he makes idols that can't even speak. Habakkuk looks at it and he looks at the situation around him and he diagnoses this world that he's in. And he sees the challenges that are below the surface. And as we look at the world around us and where we are at, I think we grapple with exactly the same issues. Perhaps a lot of the things that we are in are because somebody else is unfair, because somebody wants more than that's their share, right? People who, as he says, who put buy security by putting their family nest beyond the reach of danger. We all deal with that, right? People think we can grab so much that I'll keep myself beyond the reach. Idolatry again. For me to gain, you must lose. A system that allows the rich to get away with murder because they can afford the most expensive lawyers and that laughs at sin around us and immorality and it's depressing as we look at it right and we can say well what do I do it's too much for me I give up let me go into my corner pull the shutter down and just uh, wait out my days and we can do that even in our smaller spheres of influence right it's there the, chassis, the whatever we're in is too challenging the easiest thing is to just close the door and try and you know just let it pass. But God's calling us as prophets to grapple with it, to speak to these things, to understand what is his heart, what is his mind, how does he see it. So prophets diagnose the situation and then we respond. But prophets also give hope. They don't just look at it and understand all that's wrong, but they give hope. And as they give hope, and what does he get in verse 4? We have that wonderful verse that we know so well. But the righteous will live by faith. Yes, things are going wrong. Yes, things are bad all around us. But there is a way for us to live as God's people. The righteous will live by faith. The man or woman of God will live in response, will be able to navigate through life, will make choices and judgments based on his or her faith. And that's the hope that prophets give. And that's the promise that God gives Habakkuk and I want to share with you this morning that the righteous will live by faith. How do we cope with a world where the answer is not what we want to hear? Habakkuk didn't get the answer he wanted. God told him it's going to get even worse. The Babylonians were going to come and they were going to destroy the land and they were going to take everybody away. But he gives them the promise that the righteous will live by faith in the middle of the bad news. But what does it mean to say that the righteous will live by faith? Obviously, it didn't mean that they would escape with their life because God told him that the Babylonians were coming. They were going to sack Jerusalem. They were going to destroy it. Most people would be killed and those who weren't killed were going to be taken away into exile. So to say that the righteous would live by faith was not a get out of uh, jail free card. Right. It didn't mean that those uh, who were good would not get killed. Right. So what does it mean to say that we live by faith? Right? Obviously, it didn't mean that their physical life, that they would save that. If we didn't know how that sentence ended, how would we end it? The righteous will live by blank. For a second, that we don't know what the thing was. We probably wouldn't put faith over there. Right? The righteous will live by being good. Uh, the righteous will live by their acts. But Romans 3.23 says there's no one who's righteous. Right? No, not one. So where's the good news then? If there's no one who's righteous, then what's the big deal of the righteous living by faith? Because that's not a promise that you and I can claim. But we know that this verse is connected to Genesis chapter 15, where God gave Abraham the promise as he took him out and he showed him the sky and he said, your descendants would be more numerous than the skies, the stars in the sky. And we know now today that there are more stars in the sky than there's sand on the seashore, right? So that's the kind of promise and Abraham believed him and it says it was counted to him as righteousness. And we have the same today because we have believed the Lord that righteousness is now imputed to, uh, to us. And so as righteous today we can live by faith. The same verse from Habakkuk is picked up in the New Testament three times. 
And the first place Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 1, where he talks about a righteousness from God. God has given us that righteousness. It's not something that you and I would ever be able to have got. But by faith, it's credited to us. And this was the eye-opener for Martin Luther as he was looking and struggling with his own personal challenges. Uh, this verse spoke to him and he called it the gate to paradise. So that was the wonderful promise that he got and it's the promise that we have today. In a world that seems to be getting worse, we, you and I have this gateway to paradise. But I would stop for a moment and ask you this morning, have you entered there? Because if we haven't appropriated that righteousness that God offers us, then the rest of everything else is irrelevant. Right? Jesus died on the cross and the reason we have that cross before us is a constant reminder that there's nothing you and I could do. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But he died and when we accept him as our savior, his righteousness is imputed to us. And then the righteous live by faith. So if you haven't received that today, then I would plead with you, don't leave here without having that in experience in your life. But for those of us who have experienced and believed, we too can sometimes lose our grip on that promise. Because we think that, okay, we were saved by grace, but now we have to perform. Good Christians keep the rules. If we don't, we're out. God may save us by grace, but after that, we have to take it from there. It's kind of perform or perish. But that's not what the scripture says. We live by a righteousness that's imputed to us. There's nothing you and I can do to make God love us more or to love us less. He knew us from before the foundation of the world. He knew everything that we would do and we will do. And he loved us still. And he loved us enough to go to the cross. So beloved, that doesn't give us license, but we don't have to live out our life to achieve righteousness. The righteousness is given to us, is imputed to us. His righteousness, today he sees us through his son. And he looks at us and in his eyes, we are as righteous as his son is. And that's the one day. And we need to hold on to that because otherwise it's hard to live in this world and to struggle that. Augustine, the writer to the Hebrews also quotes this verse, uh, the righteous will live by faith and he brings it to a people who are facing persecution and he reminds them, hold on to your faith because God has brought you here. He's not going to let you down. Augustine said, faith is the first step to understanding. Understanding is the reward of faith. Therefore, seek not to understand that you may believe, but believe that you may understand. Warren Wearsby, and we were looking at this in our small group this week, says faith is not simply saying that what God says is true. True faith is acting on what God says because it's true. Righteous will live by faith. Faith is not so much believing in spite of evidence, but obeying in spite of consequence. Faith is not so much believing in spite of evidence, but obeying in spite of consequence. So he gives us this promise, the righteous will live by faith. And because of that, Habakkuk is able to get a new perspective. In verse 14, he says, and that verse that we know and sing in songs, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Even in all that's going around, in verse 12 and 13, it looks like the bad guys are winning. He's able to say no, but the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. There is a day coming when the whole earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. And he's able to see the end. He gets a fresh perspective. Chapter 3, verse 16, he says, literally he says, my guts are trembling. He trembles as he sees what's happening. Even though God has given him this perspective, even though God has shown him the end, that one day the earth will be filled, as he looks at what's happening around, he still troubles. And that's where we are, right? We have the big picture. We have the end. We know the last chapter is written, but it doesn't take us away from the challenges we're in today. And so perhaps like Habakkuk, we tremble. But he says in verse 17 of chapter 3, fig trees may not grow figs. There may be no grapes on the vines. 
There may be no olives growing and no food growing in the fields. There may be no sheep in the pens and no cattle in the barns. What's he saying there? As he grapples with this, as he trembles, he says, well, even if the worst happens, and I've often read this verse before and you know, I just thought it was great poetry, but no, he's, de he's describing in ascending order the challenges that are going to come on his people. He says, even if there are no figs, figs were a fruit, a delicacy, right? And he says, well, if the figs don't blossom, we'll miss it, but no great privation, right? It's a delicacy. It's something nice to have, but not absolutely essential. Then he says, but there are no grapes on the vines, and grapes were primarily used for wine. And again, he says, nice to have, but again, we could survive without the grapes. Not the end of the world. But then he goes on to olives. No olives growing. And olives in those days were used primarily for oil. Oil for your lamp and oil for your cooking. And now it's getting a little bit more serious. right? Because if you didn't have that, then you'd have no light. Uh, you, now we've got a real inconvenience that he's talking about. Even a sense of privation. But then he says the fields will no longer produce the two staples that they had, barley and wheat in their economy. Now he's talking about serious stuff. This is starvation. And then he goes on, sheep were used for wool and occasionally for food. They were foundational to the economy because even if your fields failed, at least you could go and trade your sheep with another nation and you could buy food for yourself. But he says if you have no sheep, then you have absolutely nothing to trade. You wouldn't be able to do that when the Babylonians came. And then he talks about the cattle in the barn. And cattle in those days were not eaten so much for food, but used for farm work. That's how you tilled your land. That, they were the tractor of the day. And Habakkuk is saying that you won't be even, even able to farm the next year once the Babylonians have gone because you will have nothing to farm with. So you're looking at a long-term starvation over here. Not just that there's going to be no food this year, there's going to be food no next year. This is a scorched earth that he's describing. And he trembles as he thinks about it. And perhaps some of us today can relate to that. We're in that place where we are feeling that it's been a long time since there were figs or wine. But even perhaps there's no cattle in the barn. And we're looking at it and we say, Lord, I don't know how we're going to do, where we're going to go next month, next year. And we're struggling and in our hearts we tremble with it. But he says, I will be glad in the Lord. I will rejoice in God my Savior. Even as he's quaking, he has quietness and joy. In 1851, Alan Gardner was shipwrecked on the southern tip of South America. He was the last one alive after all the others who had survived with him died of starvation. And in his last journal entry, he wrote from Psalm 34:10. He says, I'm overwhelmed with a sense of the goodness of God. How could he do that? As he faced death, as he saw everybody else, God had not saved them from the island, he saved them from the shipwreck. And yet he says, I'm overwhelmed with the goodness of God. Like Habakkuk, he could say, but I will still be glad in the Lord. I will rejoice in God, my Savior. How can you and I dwell in a scorched earth and yet rejoice while still lamenting? He's rejoicing and he's trembling. Apparently, as we look at it, joy is not just something that happens to us, but it's volitional. It's something that we make a choice to. We exercise our faith like Habakkuk. The righteous live by faith. This is not just for Habakkuk as a prophet, not just for missionaries like Alan Gardner. It's for each one of us. Wherever we are in whatever situation, God calls us by faith to rejoice. He says in verse 19, The Lord God is my strength. He makes me like a deer that does not stumble so I can walk on the steep mountains. That's where he comes to at the end of it. How does he get there? He repeats and he remembers and we don't have time. But if you look back the previous verses 5 to 10 he is of chapter 3, he recounts all that God has done for the people of Israel in the past. And he looks back and he repeats to himself how God has acted on their behalf. And he reminds himself of God's faithfulness through that. And he remembers the mighty acts of God. 
And so he reminds himself that that same God is still working today. That God is still keeping his promises. British commentator Michael Wilcox says, the human mind is incurably centrifugal, forever flying off at a tangent. <coughs> it must be brought back to the great central truths of the gospel over and over. And I can relate to that. We forget so easily. Our minds must be made, literally made to concentrate. Repeat and remember. That's how Habakkuk exercises his faith. And you and I have much more history than Habakkuk had. We have the cross before us. We have seen all that God has done for us. We know all that he's done in the 2000 years since the cross. We have this great cloud of witnesses as the writer Hebrew says. Habakkuk didn't have that, but we have that today. And so we too, like him, can repeat and remember. Then we can walk on high places. He makes our feet like a deer. In the ancient world, the high places were prime real estate because they were safe. You remember Edom thought they couldn't be reached because they lived high above. But from there you could look down and you could see everything. It gave you a perspective. But it was dangerous to get to it, uh, because it was up and it was a bit precarious. That's why you needed to be like a deer to get there. But once you were there, you had a great view. You had clear perspective. But you needed the sure-footedness of a deer to reach there. And I pray this morning that for each one of us that we too would be able to trust him and the Lord would lift us up to that place where we can get that perspective. And so he says, but I will rejoice in the Lord. I will wait, I will be joyful. The sovereign Lord, the Lord God is my strength, verse 19. And the key word there is sovereign. The sovereign Lord is my strength. God is still sovereign. He is on control. He was in control in Habakkuk's day and he's in control in our day and in my life and in your life, whatever the situation is, even in the middle of a scorched earth, God is still in control. Os Guinness says, and Kia shared this with us earlier this week, Christians do not say to God, I do not understand you at all, but I trust you anyway. That would be suicidal. Rather they say, Father, I do not understand you, but I trust you. More accurately, I do not understand you in this situation, but I understand why I trust you anyway. It is therefore reasonable to trust even when we do not understand. We may be in the dark about what God is doing, but we are not in the dark about God. We may be in the dark about what God is doing, but we're not in the dark about God. I want to just close with the small verse that Ruth Graham wrote. She says, I will lay my wise before your cross and worship, kneeling. My mind to numb for thought, my heart beyond all feeling. And worshiping realize that I, in knowing you, don't need a why. I pray that God would leave that word with us this morning. That we would take, ask for a fresh sense of understanding of the challenges in which he's placed us. And that we would claim his promise and ask him for a fresh perspective of all that he's trying to do in and around us. Let's pray. Even as we pray this morning, I know that there are may, some here who are struggling, some of us who've been in that scorched earth place for a long time, or are looking at that around us coming up, and we're struggling and asking questions. And perhaps if you are there this morning, I would encourage you, let's, if you could just stand and let me particularly pray for you and lift us up before the throne of grace and ask the Lord to restore the years that the locusts have eaten. And Father, even as we continue in your presence, Lord, we particularly, Lord, as we stand in your presence, we bring those who are standing. And Lord, ask, Lord, for your a fresh, Lord, perspective. Lord, we ask, Lord, I pray that for each one of these, that they would have a sense from you, an understanding of, Lord, what you're doing in and around them and in their life. Lord, I pray that the promise, Lord, that they will live by faith would be true 
and precious to them, Lord, and that would be a constant reminder. And Lord, I pray that you would give them a clear perspective. Lord, lift them up, as it were, on higher ground, so they can see, Lord, what you're doing. Lord, we know that you are God and we don't understand everything. But Lord, I do pray, Lord, that you would just give us a little bit of a sense of vision and perspective of what you are and the knowledge and assurance that you are in control. And I pray, Lord, that you would bring back, Lord, where the figs have gone, where the wine has gone, Lord, where the sheep and cattle have gone, that you would restore and that you would bring a fresh season, Lord, of fruitfulness and restore, Lord, all that the locusts have eaten. And for each one of us, Lord, I pray, Lord, that your faithfulness would continue, that you would help us indeed to live by faith as we go out into a world, Lord, that is, that is so much like what Habakkuk had. I pray, Lord, that you would give us your sense of what the world is on your heart and how you would have us respond to it. This is our prayer, Lord. We ask for your peace and assurance. In Jesus' name, amen.